I would like to start by saying that I shouldn't be the one giving this talk. Uh, this should be my student, Ahmed. Uh, unfortunately, Ahmed couldn't make it today because of a silly visa issue, but uh, he's a third year student. This is his uh, work, and this is part of his thesis as well. So if you are interested into the work, I invite you to actually check him out online and uh, contact him directly. So I'm just like here as the messenger. So uh, I would like to actually start the technical uh, piece of this talk by sharing uh, with you like a Facebook post. And so that Facebook post was posted a month ago by Steve Ulrich. So Steve is a faculty in London, in Queen Mary. And Steve was sharing this interesting article that shows that there are actually fewer heart attacks patients that die when top cardiologists are away and at art conferences. And so actually Steve was asking these questions. I'm curious whether the same happens when network operators are away and are not touching the network. And uh, I was intrigued, and actually the answer is yes. And the best illustration I know of this is this graph that shows that in the, um, during the weekends, there are much less BGP leaks. So BGP leaks is these misconfigurations that uh, when people mistype, for instance, the BGP advertisement and propagate prefixes that they shouldn't. And you can see that on Saturday and Sunday, there are like roughly twice as less uh, BGP leaks than during the week. So clearly, actually, humans are very bad for networks. And if you look into, uh, into studies, you will actually find that most of the mistakes and most of the downtimes in a network are actually caused by humans and not by physical equipment failing. So to give you like one example, there is uh, this, this case that happened in August 2017. So we are in Japan, and actually Google, in this case, made a, one Google engineer made a mistake that actually turned like uh, a good part of Japan internet into the dark. So if you read the article, you see that someone in Google, a poor network engineer in Google, actually uh, mistyped a BGP advertisement and sent Japanese traffic into a black hole. So the issue is that this advertisement was actually picked up by very big ISPs. So we are talking about NTT, Candidii. And so all these ISPs started to uh, use Google as transit, and basically Google dropped the traffic on the floor. So the incident only lasted a couple of hours, uh, but it was so severe that the ministers actually uh, asked the carriers to, um, to come and, uh, and make a plan for it not to happen anymore. So here the issue is really that humans are still touching the configuration, even if within a script or not, but we, there is still a human involved. And so in recent years, there's been a lot of, uh, of work on uh, configuration synthesis as a way to try to uh, address this problem. And so the, the idea with configuration synthesis is that network operators should actually not touch the configuration anymore. The only thing that they should do is tell you what are the high-level requirements that they desire. And together with a network model and a physical topology, the synthesizer can then automatically derive the low-level configurations so that you don't have to configure. You only have to tell me the high-level requirements, and this enables what you may have heard as intent-based network management. And there has been a lot of work on configuration synthesis over the last two years only. And so I'm just listing uh, a subset of the work here. But I think what is, in, what is interesting is that this work has been published in two communities. The networking community, you can see NSDI, SIGCOM, SIGMetrix papers, but also in the PL community, programming language community, and you can see papers at Popple, PLDI, and CAF. So it's really like a joint effort, which I think is nice. And so these kind of synthesizer, the way they differ is basically they support different type of requirements, high-level requirements, and they also generate different types of low-level configuration. So this is kind of how they, they differ today. But there is one issue in deploying them, and, um, and this issue actually translates into multiple problems. So one problem is that existing synthesizers, they actually generate configuration that widely differ from what a human would actually write. And this is an issue, and it was actually listed in one of the Microsoft paper, that then people don't trust that because they actually cannot reason about the output of the synthesizer, and then the operators are afraid, and then they don't dare deploying these configurations in the network. So the first problem is interpretability. The second problem is continuity. As you change the high-level requirements even slightly, you can actually generate widely different configuration. And that's an issue because as an operator, you would like, for instance, not to have to reconfigure the entire network just to enable load balancing here, for instance. And the final problem is deployability. So oftentimes operators, they have like operational concerns. For instance, if you are in the edge team, you cannot reconfigure the core and vice versa if you are in the core. So for instance, if, you, if there is a way to actually implement the requirements by only touching the edge or the core, that's something that you would like to do. But the current configuration synthesizer, they cannot support these kind of, uh, of requirements. 
So a key issue here that is kind of like, um, like found in all these problems is that the current synthesizer, they don't allow the operators to actually control the output of the synthesizer. They only allow the operators to write the high-level requirements, which is great, but nothing on the out output. And so this is where actually NetComplete and our work enter into the game. So with NetComplete, what we do is that we actually enable the network operators to precisely control the shape of the network configuration that the synthesizer will generate. And we do that using configuration sketches. So what is a configuration sketches? It's a configuration with holes in it. So let me give you an example. So this is a sketch of a Cisco configuration. You could also sketch Juniper configuration, Huawei configuration, doesn't really matter. What you see is that it looks like a normal configuration, but you also have holes. You have like these uh, red rectangles, and these indicate pieces of the configuration that the operator would like the synthesizer to automatically figure out. The black piece have to stay uh, the same. So you can see that there are different types of, uh, of holes in this configuration. There are like attributes, like for instance an IP address, a BGP local pref, a BGP community, or a link weight. But you can also leave entire piece of the configuration uh, empty. For instance, here, the entire OSPF configuration is not defined, and also the route map is not defined. And so what NetComplete does is that given the high-level requirements that you have and the sketch, NetComplete will actually produce a concrete configuration. So NetComplete will basically fill in the holes for you and will give you a configuration that is guaranteed to implement the requirements that you want and also to match the skeleton that you give me, if possible. So under the hood, the way it works is that actually NetComplete reduced that problem, this auto-completion problem, as a constraint satisfaction problem. So um, basically what we do is that we encode the protocol semantics, the high-level requirements, along with the partial uh, configuration as a gigantic formula. And so this formula is actually partially symbolic because we have holes in the configuration. So these variables are not defined. And so what we do is that we take this big formula and we give that to a solver. In this case, we use an SMT solver, Z3. And that solver, the job of that solver is to actually find me concrete assignments to all these uh, symbolic variables in such a way that uh, the configuration actually work and comply with all the requirements. And so if you do this a bit naively, uh, what you will see is that uh, the scalability is actually a huge challenge. So you will end up with a gigantic formula, and it will be impossible for like, a solver like Z3 to actually solve it in practice. So we kind of leverage two uh, insights in NetComplete in order to scale that thing. So the first thing that we, that we do is that we have like, network-specific heuristic that enable us to guide the search into this search space. The second insight is that we try to reduce the search space as much as we can as well. So we have this heuristic to navigate it and then the partial, uh, the partial evaluation to actually reduce it. So in the partial evaluation, what we do is that we try to concretize as many variables as possible before we give it to the solver so that we make it a little bit easier for the solver to find a valid assignment. So in the rest of this talk, I would like to first speak a little bit about how we synthesize route maps, BGP policies essentially. Then I would like to explain to you how we can synthesize OSPF weights, so Dijkstra-based weights. And then I would like to uh, present you some results from our evaluation that actually show that NetComplete is able to synthesize configuration for large networks. So we're talking about networks with hundreds of routers in a few minutes. So let's start first with BGP synthesis. So our goal here is to synthesize BGP policies, so this kind of like operations that, router, that the router does when it receives a route and then when it propagates the route to the next one. So as I said, what we do here is that under the hood, we encode the network-wide behavior, which is desired, that you actually want according to your requirement, as a logical formula. And there are three key ingredients in this formula. The first thing is the requirements themselves. So we actually look at what you want, and then we basically encode this as variables, and we assign values to the variables according to the path that you want. For instance, if you tell me that router A1 should prefer advertisement A1 over A2, we'll encode this as a, as a predicate, and we set that predicate to true. And then same thing if A2 then must be uh, preferred over A3. The second thing that we need to encode in the formula is actually the semantic of the protocol itself. So how do BGP routers select the routes? And so we have a bunch of constraints that actually encode the BGP decision process in this case. So here, for instance, we'll say that the route X is preferred over a route Y if the local pref is higher uh, for X than for Y. And then the final thing is the thing that we are looking for. It's the policy itself. So the policy is this partial configuration, which is partially symbolic. And what we're looking for is concrete assignment for the symbolic variables in these policies. 
And so, for instance, here, maybe the sketch that you give me is setting the local pref for, for like announcement A2 to 200, but it's not setting the local pref for the announcement A1. So we set that to a symbolic variable var x. So given all these constraints and assignments, the role of this, synthesizer, of this synthesizer is basically to assign a value to each of the symbolic variables. So here var x is the only symbolic variable because it's a simple example. But what we want is to find one value for var x that actually makes all the constraints to be true. And so here, it's actually quite easy to see that the only thing you need is for the local pref here, so var x to be greater than 200 because you know that you want A1 to be preferred over A2, and you know that A2 has a local pref of 200, and you know by BGP that you need a higher local pref in order for A1 to be preferred. So for instance here, the, um, the solver might actually return 250 as an answer. As I told you though, if you do this uh, naively, it will not scale. So there are multiple problems here, and the main two ones that we found out by doing it is actually that um, the first thing in the BGP protocols, BGP the BGP decisions depend on the OSPF, for some of them at least, and that creates uh, a joint synthesis problem now. So we are looking for the BGP configuration, but now we also need to consider at the same time the OSPF con uh, configuration. So we have that like, joint, the cross-product effect that, uh, that hurts, hurts, hurt us in terms of uh, scalability. The second problem is that if you look at like a BGP configuration, there is a gazillion of knob that you can use. So the space of the configuration is actually very big. So we need to reduce the search space somehow. So the way we solve this issue in practice is that we actually um, do iterative synthesis for the BGP protocol. So we first try to find a BGP-only configuration before trying to find a BGP plus OSPF configuration. And for the partial Policies, what we do is partial evaluation. As I said earlier, we try to concretize as many variables as possible. So I only have the time to speak about the second um, uh, solution. I advise you to take a look at the paper if you would like more details about the first one. You can also come and talk to me later. So in terms of the partial evaluation, what we do is essentially we look at the requirements and we look at the sketch as a way to concretize variables in this logical formula. And the first thing we look is the requirements that actually tell us precisely where should the route propagate and not propagate. So instead of considering all the possible propagation of all the routes in your network, we actually only consider the ones that really matter for your, for your requirements to be true. And that already simplifies a lot of the problem because we can only um, encode what is necessary. The second thing is that once we have this graph that describes how the BGP advertisement propagate, we can actually execute the sketch on them by just propagating symbolic announcement through them. And that will enable us to concretize a bunch of uh, fields in this announcement and then to reduce again the size of the formula. So let me just illustrate this with one example. So we have a network here, which is uh, four routers, three providers, and a customer. And the requirements is that the customer should only be able to send traffic to provider two. So this actually constrains the, the way the BGP routes can flow in this network. So it means that the routes from provider two can actually flow, cannot flow to provider one and provider three, but that they should actually flow to the customer. So actually this kind of like immediately gives us like a BGP propagation graph. So what we do is that we take this propagation graph and we build it for, not for all prefixes, but for all equivalence class. So we divide the prefix into equivalence class and then we have one propagation graph per equivalence class. And then we take this propagation graph and then we inject symbolic ad, uh, announcement in them in order to see what are the fields that are already propagated by the sketch. So the idea is that the sketch is defining a partial BGP behavior and we would like to use that partial BGP behavior to already trim some pieces away. So for instance here, let's say I'm injecting like a symbolic advertisement where all the fields are symbolic, basically star. And then let's say that I have a sketch on C that tells me that all the routes that go via C, I will attach two communities to them, one of them being symbolic, and then I will set the local pref to be 100. Then we can actually use that knowledge to figure out that all the routes that leave C will have as local pref 100 and will have now two communities. So by encoding this into the formula now, we actually have reduced the size of the formula. And observe that, for instance, if C was dropping routes, we could actually stop considering that route after C. Again, reducing the problem. So this is how we do it for like BGP synthesis. So let me now speak about how we can synthesize weights uh, for OSPF. So OSPF is a Dijkstra-based mechanism. So the problem here that we're facing is that I give you like a bunch of requirements, and then I'm asking you to find weights for the edges in the graph such that a Dijkstra-like protocol will actually compute paths that match these requirements. 
So as for BGP, we encode this as a constraint satisfaction problem. So let me give you an example here. So we have this network with four routers and these weights, and these weights actually induce that the choice path between A and C is a dark one. And let's say that now the requirements have changed in your network, and you actually want to enable load balancing. So that's what you want to have, your network behavior, you want this. And now the question that you are facing is how should you configure the OSPF weights in order for this to happen? So the way we do it, uh, if you do it naively first, is actually pretty simple if you think about it. So what you want is essentially to say that all the paths that are not the green one should have a cost which is higher than the green one. That's one. And then you want to say as a second thing that the two paths that compose the green requirements should have the same cost. So it's very easy to encode that as a constraint, and you can give that to a solver, and then the solver will, in this case, immediately give you like a set of weights that are correct. So here, the two green paths have a cost of 300, and all the other paths have a cost which is greater than 300, and for implementing the requirements. So all is fine. The issue is that this doesn't scale. And the reason it doesn't scale is that, in my simple example, I'm iterating through all the possible paths in the graph between A and C. And so, as you probably know, as the, net, as the network starts to grow, the number of paths between two points start to grow as well. Actually, in theory, it is exponential in the size of the graph. So the way we solve this problem is by using a technique which is called counterexample uh, counter guided inductive sy uh, synthesis, or SEGIS for short. And the, the idea here, the intuition, is that we can actually uh, speed up the synthesis um, uh, a lot by just considering counterexample and like, iteratively learn a solution instead of trying to consider all the paths at the same time. And so the intuition here is that even though finding the weights is very hard, checking if a given set of weights map to your requirements is very easy. You just run Dijk's rights and log n, and it is super fast. So what we do is that given the graph here now, I will not consider all the paths anymore. What I will do is I will consider a sample of the paths. So let's say um, in my case that I will only have one pass, for instance. So here I have the pass A, B, D, C. And what I will do is the same thing as before. I will, I will ask the solver to find me cost, so find me the, the cost over each edge, such that the green pass, the two green paths, have a cost which is less than the red pass and only adding one, uh, one, ed, one red pass. I will run the solver, and then the solver will actually return me a set of weights. So for instance, it will return me this set of weights. Then what I will do is that I will actually run Dijkstra on this graph, and then I will check whether the requirements are met or not. So if I run Dijkstra, you will actually realize that the requirements are not met. So here, the actual pass is not the right one. The actual pass is the one that goes up. The reason why it is not the right one is because I didn't consider all the paths. I only consider a sample of the paths. So that's why I actually got it wrong. But that's OK, because what you can do is just take this actual pass now and use that as a counterexample and just throw it away in the sample pass set. And then you reiterate the process. And so this thing, this procedure, actually converges very fast. So it only takes us a handful of iterations to find an assignment of way that works in practice. So it's actually very good in practice. So let me speak now a little bit about the evaluation and how we, um, we can actually synthesize configuration in large networks in a few minutes. So I want to focus on two questions here. The first one is, can NetComplete synthesize large phase configurations? The answer is yes. And the second one is, I want to show you how does the concreteness of the sketch impact actually the synthesis time. So obviously, the more uh, loose is the sketch, the more um, time it will actually take to synthesize the configuration, right? If I only have to find one weight, then uh, it will be very fast. While if I have to find like an entire OSPF configuration, obviously I need to work harder to find that one. So we actually fully implemented NetComplete. Uh, we have a prototype in 10,000 10, lines of Python. As I said, we use Z3 on the NIS. And our prototype supports like OSPF, BGP, and static routes and as partial and uh, concrete uh, configs. And we output actual Cisco configurations as, a, um, as, a, as an output, and we actually tested them. So we, we can tell that they work and that the requirements are validated. So in terms of data set, what we use as a methodology, we consider like um, 15 topologies from Topology Zoo, ranging from small to large. Uh, we use a bunch of requirements. So we use like simple pass, any pass amongst like a set, ECMP uh, constraint, and other pass. 
So we consider both OSPF and BGP. And the way we build the sketch in our evaluation is by taking concrete configuration and throwing away a bunch of parameters from it. So basically creating holes in our configuration, and that's how we build the sketch. So what I want you to remember, uh, the key takeaway from the evaluation, is that it only takes us a few minutes to synthesize the configuration in large network. And so these are results for OSPF. The results for BGP are actually quite similar. I advise you to take a look at the paper. And these results are, um, they pertain to like um, a case where we generate uh, 16 requirements and the sketch is 50% symbolic. And you, as you can see, it only takes us a few minutes in large networks. So we're talking about a network with 150 nodes, and it only takes us four minutes in the worst case to generate, uh, to synthesize the configuration. So it's actually quite fast. If you don't use the counterexample guided synthesis that I showed you before, it's actually two orders of magnitude slower and actually times out most of the time. So it takes more than 24 hours, and then the timeout was 24 hours, so we just uh, stopped. So now I want to uh, briefly explain you how does the synthesis time vary as the sketch becomes more symbolic? So on the x-axis here, you see the percentage of the sketch which is symbolic. So zero means the, the, the configuration is fully concrete, there is nothing to synthesize, and 100% means the configuration is fully symbolic, so everything has to be synthesized, all the weights have to be found. And on the y-axis, you will see the OSPF synthesis time. And again, I'm speaking about large topologies with 150 nodes and 16 requirements. And these are the results. So as you can see here, we basically range from zero seconds, because there is nothing to synthesize, to a little bit more than 1,500 seconds. So this basically means like 20 minutes. So this is kind of a worst case for us, because obviously um, if 100% of your sketch is symbolic, then the sketch serves no purpose. You are basically like a normal synthesizer. So usually you will be closer to the, uh, to the left part of the graph than the, uh, the right part. Still, what you can see is that basically the growth is, uh, is linear and uh, it does not explode. So to conclude, what I presented you is NetComplete. So NetComplete is a configuration synthesizer which is able to autocomplete partial configuration, so configuration with holes. And it will basically fill up the holes and leave the concrete piece intact. In, under the hood, we phrase the problem as a constraint satisfaction problem. It doesn't scale by default, but we use two insights to actually make it scale. The first one is uh, network-specific heuristic, and the second one is partial evaluation. And our evaluation shows that NetComplete actually scales to realistic network size. So we actually can, can uh, produce configuration in networks with 200 nodes in a few minutes. On this, I would be happy to take your question. Thank you. Sure. Go ahead, Sanjay. Uh, Laurent, uh, very nice uh, work. So one question I have about the um, OSPF um, weight generation. Uh, if, if I if, if, I, if I do it in the context where I'm given a traffic matrix and want to generate weights to keep link utilizations low or something like yeah. that, more of an optimization problem, can this approach work? I think so. So I, I think what essentially what you need to do is to run the uh, the TE uh, procedure as a front end, right? And okay. then what the T uh, so you run your T algorithm. What the T algorithm produce is basically where should the traffic go? So you give me the requirements, the high level requirements, and then what you can use is uh, you use NetComplete to actually synthesize the weight that will uh, that will meet these requirements. So I wouldn't I wouldn't include the TE I wouldn't encode the TE in SMT right uh, I would use a, a classical TE box just before and then the TE box will give me the pass and then you use NetComplete to actually give you the pass and then the operator can play with a constraint uh, like for instance I don't know maybe you don't want the, the weights to be too crazy or like to be within some bounds and then NetComplete will actually find you the weights that correspond to that so I think the answer is definitely yes it can be used for that but not I would not solve again the T within the SMT itself. Okay, thanks. Hi, this is Yifei from CMU. So I like this work, and uh, I'm particularly wondering uh, how hard it is for operators to uh, give this sketch. Yeah. Have you have any experience of that? With, uh, yeah, I don't have experience with that. So uh, I'm, I hope it will be deployed at some point, right? But I think, I think you're right that um, there is, I mean, it's unclear whether for like any any kind of requirements, the operator will know what, the, what actually what the hole should be. 
But I think this, this can be extended to deal with this kind of, uh, of constraint as well. So you might imagine that I give you like a concrete configuration and requirements that are not solved by the configuration. And then the problem that you face now is figuring out where to put the holes yourself. So this actually goes towards um, like a kind of thread of work like which, uh, which is called like configuration repair, where you try to actually like generate another configuration that implements different type of requirements. So I think this can, the backend can definitely be reused for that. And uh, I think you, your point is definitely valid that uh, for some requirements, uh, I think they will not know, and then the entire configuration will be a, will be a whole, which in this case kind of nullify the, the benefit. Thanks. Yeah. Um, hi, um, this is Hao Xuan from UPenn, and thanks for the talk. It's cool. Um, in fact, I, I have kind of like relevant question, just like have you encountered like what if the sketch is too strict, like just too yeah. few holes for your requirements? Like yeah. do you have any hints like where to put the new holes? Yeah, so yeah, that's a good question. So uh, y y to paraphrase it, uh, so I think your question is, what if the sketch actually does not enable the requirements to be uh, to be actually made, right? So uh, for instance, uh, what if the sketch is actually dropping a route and then the requirements is actually mandating like a, a router behind this to actually use that route? Yeah. So what will happen in this case if the sketch is too strict is that we will not be able to synthesize the configuration and then we basically return on set, meaning that it doesn't work. And here, what you can do, though, is actually leverage the constraints that are not satisfiable to actually, you can show that to the operator, and you can show, okay, you have an issue here, right? You are, like, asking me to, uh, you're asking me for that router to go right, but the router that you are, like, forwarding traffic to is dropping the route, so it doesn't work. And then the operator can actually look at the uh, cons conflicting constraint and then relax the holes in a way now that to make this, the sketch a little bit more broader. So do you mean, like, you can pinpoint, like, which configuration for which specific switch is like hindering you from? What we can do is pinpoint the constraint that are conflicting with each mm -hmm. other, yes. And uh, I think we can even take it what you, to what you are saying, which is even pinpointing the, let's say, the configuration lines that, uh, that are concrete and that don't work. But this is, uh, this is something that we, didn't, that we didn't do. But the constraint, we can definitely show them to you, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Lauren, again.